Okay, and um, I'm going to talk about Encodec today. Um, Encodec is a, uh, it's an audio compression algorithm, um, or like ar arc, or sorry, architecture. Um, and the goal is, say, given like a, a waveform, uh, probably some sort of speech, which w can be like vi visualized as some sort of waveform and uh, some, something like this. And the waveform is represented as a vector. Um, and if it's sampled at say 16K, then, uh, and this vector in the, this uh, speech pattern was two seconds long, then our vector would be 32,000 values large. And that is terrible to work with. Nobody wants to work with a vector that is 32,000 uh, values large. Um, no, that's it's not fun. That is, um, it's a pain. Um, so what you can do is, uh, or what the goal is, is to reduce this, this raw waveform into a vector representation or some sort of, um, encoded representation that's actually useful. Um, so the, the goal is to take this vector and encode it into some embedding, uh, some smaller embedding that's, that actually is more meaningful and a lot easier to work with. Um, usually you may work with, uh, there's a diagram here. You may work with a spectrogram or there's a, there's a ton of different spectrogram algorithms, but you may work, uh, usually you see algorithms that work with spectrograms and they're used to reduce the, uh, waveform into a uh, vector representation. Um, what a spectrogram kind of does real quick is it, it, like, it, it takes the Fourier features of the, the audio source, but um, one of the problems with taking Fourier features of an audio source is um, the Fourier transform, it looks at global information. If I were to do a single Fourier transform of our, of our audio signal, then it looks for global features within the audio signal. But the problem with speech is there's not a lot of global features if you look at the, the waveform. Uh, w the way a spectrogram does it is it kind of takes um, like a windowed uh, Fourier transform. So uh, this first window right here, uh, we would take the Fourier transform of that, and then we would take the Fourier transform of the next window of our of our um, audio signal, and that would be represented by another vector. And you can think, uh, you can take say sixty four Fourier features from each of these um, sampled windows, and you'll get a, ni a very nice representation that is um, it's it's a lot more compact and a lot more manageable. So. In this case, say we do it 125 or 256 times. So we have 256 windows, and then we have 64 Fourier features from each of those windows. Then we'll get a spectrogram that is of size 64 by 256. And a lot of the time you see, um, like you'll throw this through a convolutional neural network, and then you get out your embedding, and you treat the um, spectrogram as an image. But the, the problem with treating the spectrogram as an image is um, a convolutional neural network, it was made for more local features that, and then uh, you can increase the, the spatial resolution and it'll, it'll find more global features later in the network. Um, but with a spectrogram, it, th that prior may not be what you're looking for. Like for an image, it, it, it may be easy to find like an eye of, of a cat or something like that using a convolutional neural network, but the features within a, a spectrogram are a lot different than in a, in a natural image. So uh, maybe a convolution isn't perfect for what we're trying to do here. But anyways, that is the way you normally see it done where you convert it to a spectrogram and then you, you can reduce that to a vector like you normally would with an image. Um, in this case, we, they uh, encodec uses this crazy <laughs> looking architecture here. It has an encoder, it has a decoder, it has a quantizer, it has a discriminator, it has all the fancy words in it. Uh, it even has like a hundred loss terms. I think, I think it has seven loss. Uh, I think seven loss terms total. Um, maybe eight. Uh, there's a lot of loss terms. Um, 
But yeah, I, let's just break it down step by step. So to start, we have the encoder, good old, good old encoder that we have a waveform. Our raw signal and we have our vector which they they call x and they say our vector x has or is normalized between um negative one and one and it has ca number of channels and the 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 waveform is t values large so it, like i showed above if this was a two second audio clip and we sample at 16k then t would be equal to 32,000. Uh, and usually you see waveform, or you usually see sound or music in um, with one or two channels. Uh, but I, I don't know why you would have more than two. Like in, in your headphones, you have left and right. Um, uh, those are the two channels. But I, I guess if you had some crazy audio signal, uh, maybe surround sound or something like that. I have, I have no idea. You'll have more than two channels, but it doesn't really matter. What they say is they take in an arbitrary number of channels and um, uh, and they and then they pass this through a cond one d. And they basically have a bunch of convolution stacks uh, over and over again to slowly decrease the. Um, the, the spatial size of the of the audio signal and um, get out a smaller represent a smaller more compressed representation of the audio signal and they do this using conv one ds so this is some smaller representation here and then they uh, and that's the first part the the multiple convolution blocks and then they feed this through an LSTM um, I think they feed it part by part. Um, so it'll start here, then it'll go here and here, and it'll encode each of the each of the parts in the in the uh, encoded representation so far to get the um, I guess to put a temporal prior on to, to keep a temporal prior on the on the current waveform, and uh, like as an LSTM, it'll start from left and it'll go all the way to the right. So an LSTM would naturally have the the prior of I start uh, I start on the left in a waveform. The waveform is temporal. So as as I'm speaking, um, the audio before before or the audio what I said two seconds ago would probably depend on what I said now. Like there's some natural um, there's natural temporal information in a waveform, and that's what an LSTM captures. So that'll encode it to. Um, probably the same vector size, and then you do another comb one d, um, and you get out a vector, uh, which is z, and that is of shape, um, I think it was d by t, where yeah, it was of shape uh, yeah d by t, uh, yes, where d is the number of channels. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah, so you have, you have this, or, uh, d, yeah, d, d would be, yeah, you, you get out a vector of shape d by t after you do a bunch of conv 1ds and the LSTM, basically you're, th you're just throwing through this through an encoder so you can get out some vector representation that we can work with, um, and the trick with the conv 1ds is you can use strided, um, inputs, I don't think they use a dilation at all, uh, they say down here, yeah, just a straighted input with um, some yeah with a kernel size of three and then skip connections like like a normal not like a normal convolution except um, uh, in a normal convolution you use uh, you don't really use straighted uh, windows that much but in, in this case you use uh, two f two four five and eight strides so very large strides and the reason you use large strides is if I were to normally take a three two thousand part vector and try to encode that using a convolution, it'll take so many convolutions to try to get that information out of there. But if you use a strided convolution, then um, it skips past some of the information, but since the information is very close to each other, like um, it, it 
probably doesn't really matter and you can compress the information faster. Like a normal convolution, it would look here and it would have overlapping windows, but a strider convolution may not have overlapping windows or it may be overlapping by a, a much smaller amount. So you jump a lot further whenever you're doing your convolution. It's not right next to each other and overlap, uh, overlapping as much. So now we have our vector representation here, which we obtained using the encoder. So our raw waveform is now in a vector representation of shape um, d by t, where d is the number of channels and t is the, the, the temporal embedding dimension. Um, and now what we do is we do this uh, we, we do this crazy thing, which I, I didn't, I've never heard of until I read this paper, but it's actually, it's, it's pretty cool how they, or what, what it is. It's, it's called, uh, residual vector quantization. You've probably heard of it before. Um, I have not. So we're, uh, we'll go over that real quick, but, um, yeah, you can kind of compress this information, um, more if you use residual vector quantization. Uh, so we have our vector here. Uh, actually, first, let me explain what residual vector quantization is. So let's say we have a vector that's, uh, of sh that is of shape, uh, or that's in R3. So a vector, uh, which we'll call X, and this is in R3. Uh, so it's just a three-part vector. And what we can do is we can create multiple code, what, 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 what we call code books. So this will be code book one. And each code book has uh, multiple parts to it. Um, in this case, we'll say our code book is of size six. And uh, that is not, yeah, that, that is, uh, so our code book is of size six. This is code book one of size six. And we want it to, we want, we want the code book uh, size to, I mean, the code book size is kind of arbitrary. Uh, it depends on what you want. You probably want this to be some a, a sort of small number, but not too large. Um, you'll see why um, in a sec. But you index each of these vectors, and uh, I'm just representing the vectors as the same size here. And uh, I'll arbitrarily define them as these vectors here. So we're going to have six different vectors, and they're all going to be of size three in our codebook, codebook one. Uh, one, one point five zero zero, one point five one 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 one. All right, so this is our first code book. And in what you do with vector quantization is you would say, okay, I have um, my vector, and then you would look for the closest vector in here, and that's kind of all you do. Um, but in a res and it's 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 not that good normal vector quantization, but residual vector quantization. What it does is you take the original embedding, and you look at you look in your uh, your co your first code book, and you say, okay, which embedding is closest to the current embedding I have? Um, in this case, I think it would be the bottom one, uh, five, uh, the 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 fifth index in, in code book one. And what you do is you, you take the residual between the two. So in this case, it would be 1 minus 1 to get the first index. And our residual would be 0, and then 2 minus 1, 1, and then 3 minus 1, which is 2. So now our, now our vector uh, can be rep represented as 0, 1, 2. But we, also, um, say, but we also store information of what, we, um, what index we had. So in this case, our index was 5. Now we can stop here and we can say, okay, if we have a really good code book one, then five will represent our vector really well. In this case, five or vector five is one, 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 and that doesn't represent it very well. So what we can do is we can create a second code book, code book two, uh, which uh, we can say also has six entries in it. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, and uh, let me define the the values in here. Zero, two, zero, zero. It's it's difficult um, to define diff values that are too different because we only have three um, degrees of freedom we're working with here. 
but uh, yeah, there we go. So now we have our second code book. In our second code book, we say what vector in our second code book is this close, closest to our residual that we currently have. In this case, it would be three. Three is pretty close. And we take the residual between uh, vector three and our current residual. So residual one and residual two. And residual two will become zero, zero minus zero, zero. Um, one minus one, that's zero. Uh, 2 minus 1.5, that would be 0 0.5. So now our residual becomes 0, 0, 0.5. And our index becomes, and our index is 3. So now we can represent our um, original vector as a vector 5, 3, using the indices that we currently have. And uh, this is very useful because we just compressed um, a three-dimensional vector into two dimensions. And then we can use this as our as our embedding from now on. And the cool thing is you can actually get the original vector or close to the original vector um, just using these indices. And all, all you have to do is take the the indices um, or take the vectors at these indices to get our original vector. So our embedding, um, which we'll call Z, is equal to this and our vector x, which is equal to the original. Now what we want to do is produce x hat, which is our reconstructed original um, encoding from the vector. So in this case, it would be, say, um, or sorry, in this case, it would be, uh, so, recon so x hat is our reconstructed um, x, and it would be codebook one of five. That's our first index plus codebook two of three. And that's our second index. And you will add these two vectors together. So it's one, one, one plus zero, one, 1.5. And you will get out one, two, 2.5, which is close enough to x, which was one, two, three. Um, and in in reality, your code books will probably be better than this because you have them, you, you can learn them. But uh, in this example, the reconstruction is, isn't gonna be perfect, obviously. Um, if we had a vector that was exactly this, then it would, then in our encoder representation five, three, it would be the exact same encoder representation as one, two, three. But in embedding space, it would probably be close enough, and we can say, okay, that's fine. As long as our code books are good enough, then, then it's okay. And um, it's a very good way of compressing information into less dimensions. Uh, let me go to where they do that. Yeah, so in this case, uh, yeah, so residual vector quantization. And in this case, they say um, x, the input is in R of, so it's D by T, which is equal to um, 10, 10, 24. Uh, yeah, so in this case, it would be 10, 24 by T, and T is still arbitrary. It's some time dimension. And what they do, yeah, so and th and then you just feed this through your residual vector quantization and you get out say z which is in r of n q by t. So for each um so you have a signal uh or you have your encoded signal which is of size t and you have d of those or and each 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 part each of the time parts is um, d large, so each each time part is represented as a vector of size d, and then you convert each of the vectors, or each of the time r representing vectors into um, the in, into a vector of size n q. Um, so we go from ten twenty four, and they use thirty two code books. So we go from 1024 by T to 32 by T um, using the codebook method uh, we showed above. So we would have 32 of these codebooks. We would have codebook one, codebook two, codebook three, um, up to 32. 
and then you do the encoding we showed here um, t times. So you do the encoding for each part of the time vector or time matrix to get your output representation, which is z in r of n q by t or 32 by t. And that's very useful because you just went from this 1024 uh, dimensional space to this 32 dimensional space, which is so uh, that's that's a massive compression. And if your code books are good, you can reverse that transformation, and it's not super lossy. It's it's of course it's going to be lossy because you went from this super high dimensional space to this much lower dimensional space, but it's not going to be that bad if you have good code books. Um, yeah. Uh, now, um, whenever you have the, yeah, so, so first you throw it through the CNN, I mean, we can kind of summarize real quick. So you throw it through the CNN, you have, um, a vector of shape CA by T, um, and then you throw this through the, the, the encoder, and then you get out, um, an embedding uh, of shape, um, be d by t and uh i think in this case t would be the t here would be less than the t here uh i don't know why they represented it as t but yeah anyways you take uh you you compress it down using the encoder and then you feed this through the residual vector quantization and then you get out a vector um which i guess we'll call z2 or something like that which is an r of um, 32 by t. So you compress it down into this much smaller representation using first the encoder and then the quantizer. Um, and then the decoder is the goal of the decoder is to take this and get back our original, um, sorry, our original trend, our original waveform. And what you do is you do the reverse residual vector quantization where you take the indices and you add them up. And that'll give you, say, z hat 1. That's z1. And, and that'll, reversing the transformation should give you a very close, uh, like z1 hat should be very close to z1 if your code books are good. And then the decoder is just the inverse of the, the encoder. So that's uh, just like a normal autoencoder. So that should give you uh, a good waveform, or that should give you a good representation output, which is of shape CA by T. So all you're doing is you're taking this waveform, you're putting it through the encoder, you quantize it, and then you have your your representation here. And then you undo that um, just so that you can learn that transformation. And um, we'll get to the loss functions in a sec, but the idea is you take this, you throw it through the encoder, you throw it through the residual vector quantizer, and then our after the residual vector quantization, our really small embedding is our embedding for our um, for our our waveform, um, and that that'll be what you use say in a downstream task, whatever whatever that may be, um, and then for the the loss you will you'll convert that uh, using the the reverse of the quantizer and then the decoder so. That's what we have so far. Uh, we'll get to this other part in a sec, but um, before we do that, uh, there is this one issue with uh, the residual vector quantizer, and uh, they they kind of they do something to they do a little trick to kind of to kind of bypass that or to try to bypass that, uh, which is down here. So. Whenever you, so what residual vector quantization does, like we just said, is it takes a vector x, which is in R of d by t, d by t, and then it converts it to an embedding, say, z of R by um, n q by t. Now, the problem is you have to do the codebook lookup, like uh, noticed how up here, whenever we did the codebook lookup for one vector, and that vector was small, it took a while. Well, you have to do that lookup t times, and if t is large, then you have to do this a lot of times. So residual vector quantization may be really good, but it's really, really, really slow. Um, 
they try to bypass this by using a transformer. And the nice thing about transformer is it does stuff in parallel. So you can encode all of these in parallel if you have a good transformer. So what they do is they take our, they take the, the discrete um, representation. Oh yeah, I did forget to mention um, a residual vector quantization. It basically takes a continuous, a continuous representation X and then it maps it to a discrete. Uh, so it maps it from a continuous space to a discrete space, and then reversing that transformation goes from a discrete space to a continuous space um, in the vector representation. Um, because the indices are, are discrete, they, they're not continuous values, while in the, the um, original embedding, the values are continuous. Uh, so it's just mapping from continuous to discrete space. So we take our discrete vectors, made by the residual vector quantization, which is in n cube i t. So we take our discrete representation, which is n cube i t. Or I guess, oh, I mean, this matrix would be t by n cube, but that's fine. Transpose does not really matter as long as you get the idea. And then we do the reverse. So continuous. Uh, in d by t. So then you do the reverse. You you reverse your um, residual vector quantization to get your continuous representation in t by d, or d by t. Um, so you're just doing the, the reverse transformation of residual vector quantization. And then what you'll do, um, and this, this will be basically um, your time so like you can think of this as a as a sequence where time is your your sequence length and then d is your embedding size. So in this case it'll be t or it'll be 1024 by t or t by 1024 values. So you have t vectors of shape 1024. Um, and you can model this like a like a normal old language model task. So you throw this through trans a uh, transformer. And you get out a, uh, you get out an embed, you get out embeddings of the same shape. So this would be t by d, and this is your output. Uh, and this is of shape, yeah, t t by d or d by t, whatever. Uh, I think in this case it would be t by it would be t by d. So you take our you take our initial embeddings outputted from the residual vector quantization, you reverse it. And then you throw it through the transformer, and you get out some embeddings and uh, from the transformer, which is of shape t by d. Now what they do is they take one of these, or for each of the embeddings in the time domain, they take it, and then they map it to, so this would be um, a vector of shape d, and then they map it to um, rq linear layers, so, sorry, nq linear layers. So you have nq different linear layers, um, uh, which would be 32 linear layers. It's one for each of your code books, and then it maps the um, it maps your d-dimensional vector into yeah. So it'll it'll map these vectors into um, I, mean, I guess you can encode it into some smaller dimensional space in the in the transform, but. Yeah, you map this to um, some embedding, and this Im what this embedding is right here is it represents a probability distribution over all indices in the codebook. Um, yeah, so you have your you have your um, Q codebooks. So you have your Q is equal to thirty two codebooks, and for each of these codebooks, you take the uh, you you pass the embedding which was outputted from the transformer. You throw it through some linear layers, and then you get out your softmax distribution. And remember that our codebook had um, a bunch of different indices in it, so 0, 1, 2, blah, 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 10, 24. Your distribution is over this, and it's your softmax distribution, which you can just take the max of, and in this case it would be, say, 2, and then that's your index. Um, and you do this for each of the codebooks, so your output would be of shape... Like in this case, your output would be of shape n cube by d, where each of these, 
where each of these, like this first vector right here, would represent the probability distribution over all the indices in your in code book one. So this would be code book one, be 0, 1, 2, 10, 24. And you would sample this and you would get your index. And then you do this for code book two and code book three and all the way to code book 32. So, you, um, uh, so that you have this representation, this matrix representation of softmax distributions, which you can sample so if we if we sample if we sample these, then you get out a um, then then you'll just get your nq vector. It'll just be nq, uh, which equals thirty two. Thirty two equals nq. So uh, if you sample this because they're each softmax distributions over um, uh, ten twenty four because they're just softmax distributions over the number of uh, indices in the code books, then you get out your your um your vector representation and notice how nq was actually our embedding for the original codebook representation and the idea is uh we have our codebook or we we have our original matrix which um so we sent we sent our waveform so uh we sent our waveform this was x we sent it through the the, the encoder and then we got out our representation, which was um, t by d, or d by t. Uh, so z in r of uh, d by, yeah, it was d by t. And then you throw this through a residual vector quantization. And then you get out um, uh, a matrix of shape n q, number of code books by t. And remember, the residual vector quantization is slow, but instead, what you can do is, let's say we have a really good transformer that we trained. And remember, the transformer outputs, it essentially outputs an, N, uh, an NQ vector for each vector in the time, or in, in, our, in our time sequence. And uh, uh, so you throw this through our transformer. And then the output of the transformer will just be our nq by t sequence if we trained it well enough. And the way you train it is you take the softmax output and you train it so that it's it matches the rvq, the residual vector quantization output. So that way we can just take all our vectors. Um, so during inference time, you won't have your residual vector quantization. Uh, you won't have this. But what you do is you take your continuous representation, your output of the convolutional neural network, you throw it through the transformer, our trained transformer, which is supposed to match the residual vector quantization, and then our output, your distributions, and you can just sample the distributions to get your, your NQ by T matrix, which is exactly what we were looking for. And if the transformer is good, then it'll exactly match the residual vector quantization, and you get a really fast algorithm. Since the transformer does all these in parallel, unlike residual vector quantization, it's much faster than residual vector quantization. And that's why they train this transformer. So going back to yet again, the original diagram, we have our encoder, and then the encoder outputs a D by T matrix. You take the D by T matrix, and instead of throwing it through the residual vector quantization, you'll instead throw it through the, the transformer uh, during inference, which is fast. And then that'll output a nq by t. And then this will be your embedding. Um, but yeah, before we do that, we actually have to train the thing. So let me go to that. I've been kind of skipping over that because there's so many loss functions. But anyways, I, I hope you get the idea of you take it, you, you pass through an encoder, you throw through the residual vector quantization, and then you get your, your embedding. And then you can do the reverse residual vector quantization, throw that through the decoder, and then you get the, the reconstructed uh, waveform. But um, you can also train the trans a transformer in while you're doing that so that you can get a, um, a fast residual vector quantization or residual vector quantization approximation. Um, and uh, like I said, the loss is between the output of the transformer 
and the output of the residual vector quantization because you want them to match. So, oops, uh, yeah. But now we have to get, actually get to the, the loss terms. <laughs> There's just a lot. Um, yeah, so let's, yeah, let's just get into them. <laughs> um, okay, so our first training objective, we have uh, LT is equal to, uh, actually I'll draw, I'll draw the diagram up here. So uh, remember our diagram is we take, we have X, we throw it through our encoder. Uh, we pass this through residual vector quantization. We get out say Z. We throw this through reverse residual vector quantization. And then uh, we pass this through the decoder. Decoder. And this will give us x hat. Now our first loss term is just the good old good old MSE. So LT is equal to the MSE. So uh, actually, it's not mean squared error. It's the L1 loss, the L1 norm of um, x and x hat. Um, they use L1 norm in here. Uh, so it's not mean squared error. It's mean absolute value error. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what it would be in this case. Um, so yeah, you're just comparing x to x um, hat, uh, normal autoencoder stuff. Now, the second loss term is L sub f, which they call, um, I, oh, it does not have a name, but um, what you do for this ter what you do for this term is you take your x you take your x value here and you convert this to the spectrogram that you mentioned in the beginning so you have this spectrogram looking thing and then but you also have x hat and that can also be transformed into a spectrogram because it's also a waveform and the idea of this loss function so you can see they have one here for x, and then they have one here for x hat. That's x hat. And that was our first loss term. Uh, or that was our first loss term. Uh, second one is ls. Um, let me go back down here. Uh, yeah, so our second loss term would be this massive thing over here. So it's one over, I'm not writing it out actually. Um, yeah, so you, 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 it's basically, uh, it's a loss term between the spectrograms. Oops. So uh, the spectrogram of x hat, so or the spectrogram of f, x, and the spectrogram of x hat. Um, oh, they represent it as s s i of x. So this would be x i of x. This would be x i of x hat. And it's it's pretty simple. All you do is take the the L1 and L2 loss, and then they have a bunch of other constants there for normalization purposes and stuff. But um, instead of just the, the mean squared error between, you can think of it as images, it's the mean squared error and the uh, absolute, the, the L1 norm between the, um, the images. So um, basically just normal error, um, just a very, crazy version of that. It, it probably just has something to do with the, with spectrograms and how you represent the, how, how you represent them that you need to have this crazy loss term. So, um, I mean, these two, these two, these two terms are pretty sane, uh, or these two, these two terms are pretty normal, I would say, normal autoencoder terms. Um, a third, the, a third loss term, which they call LW, that is the loss between the output of the residual vector quantization and the input. So residual vector quantization, again, I, I know I'm writing this out a lot, but you have Z in D by T. You convert this to a vector in NQ by T, and then you convert this back to, say, Z hat in R of D by T. And the idea is um, for this reconstruction loss to be as small as possible. So that's just LW um, right here, the codebook loss. Um, yeah, that's just the codebook loss. That's the reconstruction error between the two. Um, so now we have 
a loss for the encoder, decoder, and residual vector quantization. Um, L sub L is just the, the reconstruction loss that we talked about earlier for the transformer. Um, okay, now, now for the, the cool discriminator part. So um, the alone, the way it is right now, we have the encoder, decoder, and residual vector quantization, and we have methods to train those using the losses, but they add a discriminator part on there to, to add even more, um, I guess, loss power, uh, rep pa representative power of um, uh, in the loss function, um, which they define. So um, the the so so you have um, yeah, let me let me go back up here. So uh, you have our big network here, and you can think of this network as a massive, or I guess it would be a decoder. You can think of the decoder as being our generator in a way, or I guess the, res the reverse RVQ and then the decoder as being our generator. And then you have a dis our discriminator, which is saying, which is looking at the, um, which is looking at X hat, our uh, reconstructed uh, output. And it's, it's wondering, it, it's trying to discriminate if this is real or not, you know, good old, good old GAN stuff. Um, so in a way, in a way, they're using GAN loss to to make this look um, to make the to not just use a reconstruction error, but to also find more patterns in the output data that um, MSC may not model well, but the discriminator may find and model really well, um, and that's why you have a discriminator there. It's just for um, more loss, more more power in your in your loss function to model um, mistakes in the reconstruction. Um, and the discriminator, they model using, or they actually have a bunch of discriminators. So they have W discriminators. Um, in this case, it would be like W is equal to four. Uh, I don't know what, I think they use, I don't know exactly how many they use. Um, they use multiple discriminators anyways. So um, you take this waveform X hat or you take the waveform X hat and X because you want your discriminator to learn on both. But um, in this case, this is our waveform X hat. And then you, so you have our, you have your waveform X hat and then you convert this, to, um, which is in R of the number of channels by T, so C A by T. And then you convert this to a spectrogram. Um, I don't know, you, you convert it to S, T, F, T, or M, S, F, T, F, T, D. So some sort of spectrogram, which has <laughs> some sort of crazy spectrogram. Um, it's probably a spectrogram with, it, it's just some spectrogram transformation. And then you, um, and remember you can treat the spectrogram like a, uh, like an image and you throw that through the, the discriminator and then you get your, your logits out. So you convert this to a spectrogram and then you throw it through the, um, the discriminator. Now the important part is kind of the discriminator loss functions. So we take the reconstructed output, and of course you want your generator, your, your discriminator to learn uh, to distinguish between X and X hat, um, obviously. And you also want your generator to learn how to try to fold the discriminator. So you want the reconstructed value to be, or the reconstructed part to be as good as possible. So like usual, you have LD, which is equal to uh, one over K, uh, and then the sum over uh, K is equal to one to K. Oh, sorry, it's not W discriminators, it's K discriminators. Yeah, K discriminators. Max between zero, one minus D K of X plus max of zero, one plus d k of x hat. Okay, so looking at these two terms, if you if you've seen again before, this is just scan loss. You have or your your discriminator is trying to. Uh, yeah, it's it's just normal scan loss. Where uh, let me let me get the the generator. One over k, uh, the sum. Of k is equal to one k max of zero, one minus dk 
of x hat. Yeah, so this is just normal GAN loss where your discriminator is trying to make your make its outputs on fake data be as different as possible from the outputs on, uh, so this would be um, generated data because of x hat, and this would be uh, so this would be real data, and this would be generated data. Real data on the left, generated data on the right. And the idea is the discriminator wants these values to be as far as part as possible. So that's all that LD is doing. And then LG is saying, well, I want my value, the generated output, to be as close to R as, to be as close to the real value as possible. So I want my x hat to be as close to x as possible. And of course, it can only manipulate x hat, so it's saying, I know what the real x looks like, so I'm going to make my predicted value as close to that as possible. And that's modeled by the, the plus sign and the minus sign. Normal gain loss. Whatever the discriminator is trying to minimize, the generator is trying to maximize, and whatever the generator is trying to maximize, the discriminator is trying to minimize. Um, yeah, no, Normal gain loss. Um, and you do this in parallel with model training. Um, and then they also have relative feature matching loss for the generator, which is the final loss term. So L of feet, which is equal to the sum of one over K L uh, from K is equal to one to K. So a number of discriminators uh, and then L is equal to one. And then you do, yeah, I'll, just, I'll just write it out, D L K of X minus d l k of x hat over the mean of d l k of x one uh okay cool so wrote it out um so remember k so k is equal to a uh, number of discriminators l is equal to that is the, the number of layers uh, in the discriminator. Yeah, so this, is, this sums over the number of layers, uh, and then this part sums over the number of discriminators, and this is just the average of those. Uh, so you're just doing the average over the layers over all discriminators uh, for this term. And what this term is saying is I want to take the L1 norm between the discriminator output on x and on x hat, so on the real and fake data. So what this term is saying, uh, yes, this is, this is just L1 on real and fake data. So um, the higher this term, the, the further away real data is from fake data, but the lower this term, the, the closer the real data is from the fake data, according to the discriminator. And the bottom part is just the mean of the, the real data, so that's just normalization. And basically what this term is saying, for every discriminator and for every layer in the discriminator, I want the generator, so for every layer in the discriminator, I want the generator's output for that layer to be as close as possible. So we're not just saying the output of the discriminator needs to be, we're not just saying we want the, the generator, the, the, the output of the discriminator, or we want the generator to model the output of the discriminator so that the real and fake data are as close as possible. But for every layer in the discriminator, for all discriminators, we want the vectors, the uh, the intermediate latent representations, to be as close as to be as close to each other as possible. So this way, it doesn't just have to model the output of the discriminator; it also has to model the latent representation. So it it can't just model the output. So it makes it a lot more fine grained for what the, the the generator has to model and it's a lot more details than just a single value output and that's what the that's what all the loss terms are so yeah we have our encoder quantizer decoder and discriminator losses so yeah got all our losses so let's just summarize one last time real quick so we have our x which is in we have our x which is in r of uh, C A by T, and you feed this through the encoder, and then you get out Z, which is in R of D by T, uh, which where this T is smaller than this T. Um, uh, 
one thing I didn't mention, I, I, they say 75 blocks per second. So if this was 16,000, if this was sampled at a rate of 16,000, this T, then this T would, uh, it would be sampled at a rate of like 75. So it goes from 16,000 to 75, I, I think. So, uh, and that would be 1024 by 75. And then we throw this through residual vector quantization. And then we get an output, say z bar is in R of nq by d, where nq, or which would be 32 by, uh, sorry, t, nq by t, so 32 by, say, 75. And then we throw this through reverse. And um, this part right here is what you would use. You, Whenever you're done training, you would use this part for some downstream task like classification or something like that after the after this model was trained this model is unsupervised it's just training a model to get good representations out of the data and then we throw this through reverse residual vector quantization and this gives us a z hat in r of um d by t again which is 1024 by 75 and then you throw this through the decoder which would give you x hat in r of c a by t, which is say like one by 16,000. And then you take this and you throw it through the discriminators and then that's your other loss function. So this is our encoder decoder model and so on. Um, and then remember you can take uh, this part right here and you can actually throw it through a transformer instead, the tra uh, transformer, to do it in parallel once the transformer is trained. So those are all the parts to Encodec. I hope um, I hope that makes sense to you. There's so many moving parts to this. It's crazy how they got so many parts to this working. But yeah, um, if if a part doesn't make sense, please um, please ask in the comments. Uh, I'd be happy to answer. Um, I hope I got. All that right it was um like kind of the transformer part was a little confusing but yeah that overall that's that's in codec um i kind of want to use this video for um another video uh, that i'm going to make later for uh, music gen um music gen is a, a cool new model facebook made and it uses in codec and i don't want to take an hour explaining in codec in <laughs> in the original or in, whenever i'm explaining that paper so uh i'm doing it here so this is in Kodak. Um, yeah, thank you. Maybe I'll see you in the music gen paper.